One of my theories about workplace bullying is that all bullying is actually a literal physical addiction. I'm serious, I'm gonna keep saying it until I see it in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the American Bible of the profession of psychology. In order to understand my theory, it's important to understand what addiction is and what it isn't. Wikipedia defines addiction as a brain disorder characterized by compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli despite adverse consequences. The key words and phrases here are compulsive rewarding and adverse consequences. We're all familiar with the common substance addictions, drinking, smoking, illegal drugs. In fact, the only behavioral addiction currently listed in the DSM is an addiction to gambling. But the truth is, as we all know, you can be addicted to anything. Exercise, gaming, social media, Netflix. And addiction is not something that you can't live without. For example, unless you're a breatharian, we all eat food, but we're not all addicted to food. And yet, there is such a thing as a food addiction. Addiction is not something that you think that you need, but really don't. Most adults who engage in sex enjoy sex, but they're not necessarily addicted to sex. And yet, there is such a thing as a sex addiction. You can have a drink every day of your life and not be an alcoholic. As many people in small towns and rural areas, not so much in the big cities in France, continue to enjoy wine with lunch. It's not the amount and it is not the frequency. It's the use and the intent. Another one of my theories about workplace bullying is that workplace bullies are narcissists or at the very least exhibit very narcissistic tendencies. So in order to understand my theory, it's important to understand another disorder, narcissism, especially narcissistic supply. I was raised by a narcissistically and alcoholically abusive parent with also, I believe, depression, anxiety, and or bipolar disorder. And as her empathic daughter who looks like her, as empathic daughters of mothers tend to do, I blithely took on all of my mother's pain onto my shoulders as my own in an act of selfless, unconditional love and service because I am emotionally stronger and have better tools to deal with it. Because of my upbringing and my astrology, I myself am predisposed to both mental illness and addiction. And although I have not had a psychology class since high school, which was taught by the volleyball coach, I feel I understand narcissism and addiction unfortunately all too well. And one of my theories about addiction itself is that all addiction is a means of medicating pre-existing depression and or anxiety because the practice of psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry simply have not yet developed appropriate, effective, and non-addictive medications for treating mental illnesses. Another thing that I understand unfortunately all too well is workplace bullying. I am about to enter three decades of being bullied in the workplace. Narcissism is a disorder like addiction. If workplace bullies as narcissists fear exposure and are trying to hide their secrets, they're not doing a very good job. They really lay all their cards on the table. The anxiety that workplace bullies feel in the presence of the target alone is palpable. It's tangible. Workplace bullies seem overwhelmed by and overcome with anxiety. If you are empathic, especially if you are clairsentient, you can feel the suicidal depression of some workplace bullies because you pick it up after sitting next to them for less than 24 hours. You just absorb all of that stuff into your body. Many people who seem angry are not so much angry as just profoundly sad, and you can also see and feel the sadness. Narcissism is often concomitant or comorbid with addictions, and you can see plenty of that too. If you work with these people long enough, it's obvious who smokes, who's an alcoholic, 
and who's addicted to food and or sex. Workplace bullies not only take smoke breaks, but also smoke inside the workplace, which is illegal. And sometimes the stench of smoke is so overpowering, it could knock a buzzard off a shit truck. Workplace bullies are not only alcoholics, but also drink inside the workplace. After coming back from lunch with their vodka flask, you could strike a match in the fumes. It's obvious who is morbidly obese and addicted to food, which they further expose with their pathological obsession with your food. And I think it's not a stretch to say that people who engage in sexual harassment in the workplace are themselves addicted to sex. But I'm not talking about other substance or behavioral addictions here. I'm talking about workplace bullies addiction to bullying itself. Part of the definition of addiction is this idea of compulsion. Addicts by definition have poor impulse control. So do workplace bullies. If you're like me, your mama taught you that if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. You understand delayed gratification and how to bite your tongue you may meet people all the time that you don't particularly like or about whom you find certain things to be undesirable. You don't say anything, you don't do anything, you don't let on, and you don't point anything out. Workplace bullies mama ain't teach them that. These are people with absolutely no self-editor, as narcissist workplace bullies have also absolutely no spiritual awareness or knowledge, otherwise known as wisdom. They are completely unconscious. I hate to say they're not woke, but that's pretty much what's going on here. As narcissist workplace bullies possess about as much rational, reasonable, logical cognition as a gerbil on a treadmill. These are animals acting out of instinct. Bullying is a knee-jerk reaction. It's just what they do. They're on autopilot, which explains why workplace bullies are so consistently surprised by your response to being bullied. You happen to kind of sort of like, um, you know, not like it. I've asked myself over the years many times what kind of response bullies were expecting to see in me to their bullying, and the answer is absolutely none. There is not a lot of thought that goes into any of this. Another part of the definition of addiction is about reward. There is a reward for all human behavior, even if that reward is only to avoid punishment. If you're like me, you cannot imagine what can possibly be rewarding about bullying. But there is a reward. It makes them feel good. You can see it on their faces. If bullies can get in a zinger, a passive-aggressive, mean-spirited insult that is also totally not funny aimed in your direction, you can see an expression of pure glee, delight, and joy on their faces as though they are having an orgasm. Very much like a homicidal cop who murders an unarmed black man in broad daylight in the middle of the street with people with phones looking on. The final part of the definition of addiction is about adverse consequences. This video is too short for me to detail here. The horrific consequences, financial, physical, emotional, and spiritual across the board from society and organizations such as companies to targets and even bystanders of workplace bullying. But those consequences, I argue, are especially bad for the bullies themselves. And that is because of the first law of spirituality, karma. And I don't mean karma as it is defined in Hindu or Buddhist philosophy, but more sort of like an umbrella term for the universal law of cause and effect. Although the karma of workplace bullies will indeed be horrific, I argue that even if workplace bullies were aware of their karma, they are not, they would continue to bully anyway. Pedophiles rotting in prison will straight up tell you to your face that the minute they get out, 
they'll do it again because the body of a child is that addictive. And I argue it's the same for workplace bullies. Though their lives may completely fall apart, they may look back on bullying the target as one of the high points in their lives. Proof that bullying is addiction is that it is so repetitive. As targets of workplace bullying, it is important that we not be so narcissistic ourselves as to think we are the only ones. Workplace bullies have done it before and they'll do it again. They're like tailgaters on a freeway. We all want to see instant karma. Unfortunately, that's difficult to pull off. Karma can take years and even decades. The only time we get to see instant karma is when we are driving in cars on the freeway. Tailgating is a form of bullying, but watch the tailgater. As soon as he gets around you, what's the first thing that he does? He tailgates another car. That is bullying as an addiction. But the biggest proof that bullying is an addiction is the workplace bullying technique of stalking. Workplace bullies stalk their targets inside and even outside of the workplace, sometimes months and even years after the target has been eliminated from the workplace. Workplace bullies drive past your place of residence and show up where they know you go. I have counted at least half a dozen former workplace bullies after I have been eliminated from the workplace who have shown up in public parks where they knew I ran, despite admitting to me not only that they did not run, but also that they did not exercise at all. Why do they do that? The answer is simple, narcissism. A narcissist is a dead and empty soul with no real internal life or self. The real self has been substituted by the fake false self otherwise known as the narcissistic ego, a flimsy, fragile house of cards that demands constant supply, which the narcissist has to source exclusively from other people because the narcissist is completely disconnected from spirit. Narcissistic supply can be twofold. It can be positive or negative. A lot of people think that narcissistic supply is just attention, applause, approval, validation, recognition, awards, accolades. Well, it can be. I find that narcissists initially try to get supply in that way. But so often the reason that the most common target of abuse either in the workplace or in the dysfunctional family is the sensitive, the intuitive, the empath, is that empaths are by definition averse to inauthenticity. You're really not buying the narcissistic ego, you're not feeling it, you're thoroughly unimpressed and uninspired, and because you are authentic, your distaste shows. And at that point, the supply becomes negative. The narcissist feels entitled to punish you for not validating the narcissistic ego and not feeding the narcissistic supply to which the narcissist feels entitled. Narcissists are not necessarily discriminating and not very good at discernment as narcissist workplace bullies are bottom feeders. So they'll take their fix wherever they can get it. If they can't get you to like them, then they can make themselves feel better by hurting you. A bully is by definition, someone who needs to put down other people in order to feel better about himself. If you are not like that, then go ahead and say a prayer of gratitude to the Creator because unfortunately the world is crawling with people like that. The problem with workplace bullying as an addiction is that although the ultimate goal of all workplace bullying is to eliminate the target from the workplace for good, if workplace bullies accomplish that, they effectively flush all their drugs down the toilet which explains why they then need to drive past your house or follow you around the jogging trail or simply find another victim in the workplace. To my knowledge, part of the treatment of addiction is not so much to eradicate the addiction, but instead to replace unhealthy, destructive, addictive behaviors with healthier, non-destructive, non-addictive behaviors. By now, the widespread adverse consequences of addiction are well known. Cancer, liver disease, DUIs, 
financial ruin, crumbling interpersonal relationships, knowing the adverse consequences, is there something else that you can do with your time, energy, and money instead of stuffing uncomfortable feelings with cigarettes, alcohol, food, drugs, and sex? When it comes to workplace bullying, knowing the adverse consequence of karma, is there something else that you can do besides running around the workplace all day long trying to destroy innocent people to self-medicate your pre-existing mental illness. If you don't give a shit about other people, do you at least care about the personal salvation of your own soul? I used to think that the opposite of narcissism was empathy and that if anything could ever be done about workplace bullying, it would involve some kind of empathy education. And I'm not saying that because I am an educator. I believe that empathy can be learned. It certainly has been in my life in which I've healed a lot of my own narcissism and grown and expanded in empathy. I say expanded because empathy literally expands your range of emotional states, just as the universe itself is expanding. Can an army of unemployed psych majors who are interested in HR devise some kind of empathy training for workplace bullies? I've come to believe that the opposite of narcissism is not so much empathy as security. Integral to the definitions of all forms of narcissism is insecurity. A lot of people erroneously believe that narcissists are confident because they can present themselves with a lot of arrogance, bravado, braggadocio, and intense aggression that can feel almost violent. But we all know that all aggression arises out of insecurity. Narcissism is outward confidence inner insecurity and very much defined by a fragmented, fractured, insecure inner self. So perhaps to combat workplace bullying, instead of addressing empathy, we can address security. But that's a tall order because insecurity is societally endemic. There is financial insecurity in a society in which real wages have not risen in my lifetime and I'm really old. To address financial security, there needs to be an end to at-will employment to make it more difficult to fire someone. And then there is intellectual insecurity. The biggest racial and economic divide, at least in my country, is educational disparity. Everyone needs access to quality education, not some bullshit online program where you get a business degree from a corrupt for-profit institution. In cities like Paris, Brussels, and Rome, you can come from a very average middle-class family, go to the public high school around the corner, and receive a quality education, even if you have no intention of going to university and intend to cut hair or bake bread for a living. And then there is emotional insecurity in a society in which the divorce rate is over 50%. So when it comes to combating workplace bullying as narcissism and addressing the insecurity, we have our work cut out for us. Ultimately, I think addiction is a maladaptive and dysfunctional way of achieving mindfulness, which is a state of present awareness inside the body. Every mindfulness exercise begins with accessing the physical body through one of the five senses. And every mindfulness exercise involves breathing. And so does addiction. Think about the inhalation of the cigarette smoke or the buzz from the first drink or the orgasm. It is a way to be fully present in the moment inside the physical body and to breathe. So 
In the absence of emotional security or empathy, perhaps a substitute for workplace bullying in the interim, is mindfulness. So that's an introduction to my theory that bullying is an addiction. I strongly encourage the American Psychological Association to consider it. To read more in detail, I've written an essay on workplace bullying. It's on my website. I include that information in the description. The reason I created this video series is to establish a forum where targets of workplace bullying can share their stories and experiences in a kind of support group. So you can know, number one, you're not crazy. Workplace bullying is real and your feelings are completely valid and justified. And number two, you're not alone. Unfortunately, workplace bullying has happened to countless other people. So I look forward to reading your comments and I promise to try to respond to each one. Take care.